Welcome to the Learn Guitar podcast from the National Guitar Academy, the podcast that makes you a better guitarist. We're going to share some of our best guitar tips with you today. We've got a great show lined up. We're going to discuss chords and chord technique. We'll share some lead guitar secrets. We'll tell you how to sound more rhythmic and musical. And we'll also teach you some music theory. I'm your host, Mike Kennedy, and joining me today are Jack Taylor and Rob Soulsby. So let's get started with today's first segment, Lead Lines. Lead Lines is the part of the show when we discuss lead guitar techniques, scales, riffs, solos, and secondary guitar techniques. Okay, we've got tons of stuff lined up today. Jack, what are we talking about today in Lead Lines, dude? So in today's episode, we're going to be talking about guitar effects. What are they and, you know... How can you actually get started with using guitar effects? Okay, very, very important. So obviously, you know, the amount of students that we've had with the Chester Guitar Academy that have just got a guitar for Christmas or something, they've got an amp, they've got some effects pedals and yeah. they're trying to get started. Um, but it's not easy, is it? It's not easy if you've because there's, there's so many variables, there's so many things that you need to, oh, yeah. to get right. Yeah. So we thought it would be useful just to put together, you know, a real quick segment that just kind of gives people... Um, the bullet points really for what they need to get started with guitar effects mm -hmm. so I guess a point that you know we, we were discussing before we did the show that we thought would be really important is to we, is the guitar comes first and the effects are secondary yeah do you want to just expand on that for us Jack so like a lot of them I see it now even with people who mm. aren't beginners like everyone goes down the effects rabbit hole yes and often a lot of people will spend more time learning about effects and watching YouTube gear demos <laughs> than actually practicing. And it's like, yeah. it really defeats the object. So if you're going to prioritize your time, you know, spend like 90% of your time practicing guitar yeah. and then 10% playing with effects and researching about them because it's far more important to be good at guitar. <laughs> the message I think is don't become an expert in guitar effects, become an expert on guitar. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. So like, you know, the, the effects are a secondary thing. Um, and I think, but but when people often buy or get guitars like in a, in a package, so to mm -hmm. speak, they might get an amp, a guitar, mm -hmm. and the effects. Yeah. And the effects is often the most immediately gratifying for people because it's like, yeah, distortion, let's turn it up. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I think it's easy for people to fall into that trap. Rob, you know, do you want to take us through the, the next point on our list here? Yeah, well, basically, um, effects should be there to enhance your playing and they shouldn't take over like you've already said really so it's about thinking how you're going to use your effects and as it we've discussed before it's about kind of using them sparingly use them sparingly use them as highlights yeah of your performance not to mask bad playing or <laughs> yeah. to take over everything yeah. else do you know what this ties into what we were speaking about last week when we were saying about it might get loud yeah, you know, yeah. whereas how like Edge, you know, from yeah, U2 yeah. is like, you know, notoriously, uh, you know, very effects sort of driven guitarist. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, like if that's the way you want to go. It um, can, but then in some ways it can stop you developing as a guitarist. Well, that's the worry, isn't it? That's the concern. You, you know, kind of rest on your levels of your distortion yeah. pedal. And yeah. think that will... We don't want people to hide behind that. No, no. Um, you know, we want people to be able to be, you know, excellent guitarists and be able to enhance... That's how excellent right. they are yeah. with but, effects well, the, like usually when you see most guitar players it's usually the ones who are extremely developed and yeah. the ones who do have you know the quite versatile effects rigs they've already got all that in place so it's just a case of you know adding it on yeah, yeah. it's literally enhancing what's already yeah. there okay so here's just some um sort of classic examples of uh, of distortion so we've got sort of you know classic kind of you know classic rock stuff <laughs> Also have sort of more riff based stuff. Or you can play that in a more sort of you know crunchy kind of punky way. So that's that kind of big fat, you know, rock and roll kind of sound. Um, Jack, do you want to um, explain to us, you know, about some different modulation yeah, tones sure. and then we can have some examples as well. Cool. So um, here's a couple of quick examples of um, some reverb sounds now. So... <laughs> okay, 
hear how it just sounds like it's in a big cave. Yeah. That's because we, we are actually in a cave. <laughs> <laughs> People don't realise we actually record this in a cave. Okay, cool. So uh, that's got a nice reverb tone. So now let's hear something like, um, let's look at a chorus sound. So the classic chorus sound. I love how you looked at me when you said 80s, like, yeah. the 80s, like, <laughs> dismissive of me, the old guy. Um, okay, so let's hear a, uh, let's hear a flanger. Okay, now we're going to hear a phaser. Okay, now let's hear um, just a light tremolo effect. Yeah, it gives you that wobble, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, it always makes me feel a bit like seasick or something, the tremolo yeah, yeah. effect, the way it kind yeah. of affects my ears. It's got that kind <laughs> of the way. early 60s, late 50s kind of guitar twang to it as well. Yeah, it? it always reminds me of that uh, Joverkill track, that girl, you'll be a woman soon. Doesn't that have like a tremolo oh, effect, yeah. like the one off Pulp Fiction? Yeah. I think that's got like a tremolo effect. Okay, so now we're going to just look at the classic sort of delay sound. Okay, and what you can hear there is obviously the notes kind of repeating. One of the cool things about delays is you can set how long you want the delay for. So on that one, it was relatively quick. But if we listen to one that's a little bit more spread out here... cool but of course the benefit of that is that you can layer things up okay one type of effect that we haven't discussed here is loopers so uh, they've become quite popular in recent years but looper pedals essentially allow you to kind of play something and record it and then play it back and then you can play over what you recorded so it's a way that one person can sound like multiple people um, you'll often see buskers using this, but I think in recent years Ed Sheeran uses one quite a bit, doesn't yeah. he? So yeah, I think it was Katie Tunstall was the first person who like um, kickstarted that thing. In there's, recent yeah. years, definitely. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a performance of her on Jules Holland with like her doing the whole looping thing, and that was the main thing which really got I think, looping started. Yeah, yeah. I think if if people haven't checked that out, yeah, I think it was Black Horse and the Cherry Tree yeah, was the track. Yeah. So if you just yeah. Google Katie Tunstall, Black yeah. uh, Jules Holland. Um, Black Horse and the Cherry Tree. That was a nice track, that one. Mm -hmm. um, well, the great thing nowadays is so many pop songs in the charts are actually just based on a loop of four chords. Yeah. So whether it's the chorus, the verse, the bridge, the pre-chorus, they're actually, it's the same loop, and all they do is change the um, production values of each part of it. Well, it's a great way to practice your lead guitar, isn't it? It's to, like, yeah. you can just record, a, yeah. you know, four, a progression of four it, chords yeah. or whatever. And then you can just play lead guitar over that mm -hmm. yourself. So a really, really cool way to explore that. The other thing is, on a more sophisticated looper system, you can actually have multiple loops as well. So you can actually record a loop of your guitar, a loop of vocal, a loop of bass. Cool. So you can actually loop them all together. It's yeah. amazing. Really yeah. cool. Okay, just a few final points here before we move on. Um, in the bonus pack for this episode, where you're going to find a customised Spotify playlist which will show you some classic examples of each of the effects that we've discussed. You'll also find uh, an effects guide where we show you exactly what settings you can uh, put on your effects pedals um, to get those sounds. And we'll also include uh, a downloadable article, which is the ultimate guide to guitar effects. So if you want something that you can kind of, you know, look at in front of you and work your way through, then that'll be really useful. And yeah, just a couple of last points that we didn't cover off earlier was uh, one of the best effects pedals that you can have is actually just a tuning pedal so it's not mm -hmm. really an effect but it is a pedal that sits in the chain between yeah. you and your amp and obviously no matter what you play you need to play in time one of the cool things about you know tuning pedals is they mute the channel so if you're playing live you can tune the guitar up without the audience knowing because you know it always sounds quite amateurish if the person you can hear the person on stage yeah, tuning worse, yeah. and uh, and also uh, one of the most effective ways you can learn how to explore guitar effects 
is by watching your favorite artists and trying to emulate their sound. So, you know, if you like that big reverby tone of, you know, Dave Gilmour, then, you know, get a pedal and try to recreate that tone. A really important point here when we think about guitar effects is to understand how it fits into the overall picture. So on the electric guitar, there's broadly three elements. You have the guitar itself, then you have the amplifier, and then you have your guitar effects. And it's useful to think of them as three separate things. Now on your guitar, you've got controls that affect the way the guitar sounds. So you've got the pickup selector, you've got the tone and the volume controls, maybe a boost. On the amp, you've got a full range of EQs, uh, reverbs, and you know different channels that you can select. It's really important before you introduce guitar effects into the loop that you learn how to master those first two parts. Um, and I also think it's really crucial that you have a standard sound that you can fall back on. Otherwise, you know, I've lost count of how many beginners I've taught where they were like, oh, I had this great sound yesterday mm. and now I can't find <laughs> it. I can't recreate it, you know. And the reason for that is that they've changed too many variables and they don't know what's changed. Mm. So having a standard fallback sound that you can revert to as your bass bass line is really important. So, you know, set your bass, middle and treble to just mid range. Maybe always have your guitar on its neck pickup. Always have the volume up on full. Always have the tone control midway. And I think if you have that in place, then you know you've got a kind of standard sound that you can use as your, you know, that's what neutral sounds like to you. And then you can play around with effects uh, to embellish that. But if you don't get those other two parts right on the guitar and the amp, then you will just end up like totally overwhelmed mm -hmm. with all the different things that are going on. Remember guys, for each podcast, we create a bonus pack that expands on what we've discussed in the episode. Each bonus pack includes video lessons, diagrams, chord boxes, links, downloads and practice material. And basically everything builds on the things we've discussed in the podcast. There's only so many things we can explain through audio and sometimes it's easier to show you stuff and that's where the bonus packs come in handy. To download the bonus pack for this episode, go to nationalguitaracademy.com slash podcast four. Okay, now it's time for the next part of this today's show, Quick Chords. Quick Chords. Quick Chords. Quick Chords is the part of the show where we discuss chords and chord technique. Okay, today, uh, Jack, we've got a really cool A add nine chord. Mm -hmm. um, let's hear it, dude. Really nice. Can you spell it for us? Yep, so it's X02400. Okay, and if people want to see the chord box for that, they can download the bonus pack for today's yep. show. Um, one of the cool things about that shape is it's a movable shape. Yeah, so. Can you just like. Give us some examples where we can apply. Yeah, so you can basically just move this around the fretboard. I found some really cool like signs and stuff in it before. So. It's got a really nice feel to yeah. it, a big open chord. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I hope you found that useful. And uh, now we're going to move on to the next part of Quick Chords, uh, where we thought it would be useful to discuss capos with you. And... Um, I guess more specifically, we thought we could run through five ways that a capo makes your life easier as a guitarist. Um, because obviously if you're a beginner guitarist, you might not be familiar with capos or what they are, but it's a really, really useful tool. Okay, Rob, you're going to take us through the first couple of points here. Okay, so basically a capo is a clamp. It's a clamp that sits on your neck and presses the strings down so that it can effectively uh, help you to change the key that you are playing in. Awesome. So a capo is a clamp that goes onto the guitar neck yep. and it alters the key. Yes. Okay. And that's super powerful. Well, that is fantastic. Yeah. It's yeah. really useful. Uh, so the other thing about it is it means that say you've been slaving over four chords and you've kind of hit a bit of a, a plateau. Yeah. It means you can then transfer and play those same chord shapes, those four limited chord shapes you might have that you're really pleased about, but you can change and play in a different key with them. So effectively, you can still play your favourite songs that you've been learning, mm -hmm. but change the key of it just to give okay. it a slightly different sound. So if we are playing a chord progression, which is, I don't know, for argument's sake, let's say we're playing an A chord, mm -hmm. but we put the capo on the second fret and mm -hmm. then play our A chord, then actually what we hear is a B chord. Correct. So we can play an A shape, but the sound that comes out of the guitar is B. Yeah. yeah. Okay, some people really struggle to understand this concept. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some people they get it straight away but some people they, they really really struggle to get it 
I think a prerequisite here, if you don't really understand how capos work, it's to learn the musical alphabet. Yeah. Because if you don't understand like the flow of notes, then you don't understand what comes next. <laughs> yeah. You don't understand what's next or before. Yeah. So okay. capos become really, really overwhelming. I think effectively adding your capo, your clamp, changes the key, but most noticeably you'll find it means everything you play will be higher than it was before. Yeah. So if you think of it as the more you move the capo down the neck, down the fretboard, yeah. the higher the higher the tone goes. You're yeah. raising the key. Yeah. Each yeah. time each fret you move the capo up the yeah. neck, you're raising the key. So here um, are a few examples of a capo in action. So I'm just gonna um, play a quick chord progression, just E minor to G, and then I'll place the capo, play the same chord so you can hear the difference between them. So here we go. That was an open position, and then I'll just plump the capo on the third, on the fifth fret. So hopefully you can hear that the second one was significantly higher than the first one. Yeah, yeah. but Jack was still playing the same chords, so mm -hmm. that's the that's the benefit, isn't it? For me, the the, the 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 most important benefit, the biggest benefit of capos is it allows you to use easy chord shapes to play hard chords. Yeah. So it allows you to use easy chord shapes to play hard chords. And if you're a beginner, that's an absolute game changer. Because there'll be some songs that you like that might be in like a weird key, like mm -hmm. the key of B or something, you know, it's just like not you know, you've got no chance of playing those chords if you're a beginner. But with a capo, mm -hmm. then those chords are within reach. Jack, do you want to take us through the next couple of points? Yeah, so capos actually allow you to play um Gives you a bit more versatility when you're playing your chord voicings. A lot of um, open chords, um, or chords which use more open strings, there's not like a version of that chord, you know, further up. So, for yeah. example, here's like um, an F chord, but I've actually using the higher strings. So, but there's not like a G version of that chord yeah. or a B flat version in an open position. Yeah, you can't open, play that chord. Yeah, so, so using a capo. It instantly gives you like a little bit more um, leeway with that. Yeah, it allows you to play chords in a different chord voicing. Yeah, yeah. That otherwise, it would be impossible to play. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a, a classic example of using a capo to get a different voicing that I often use is Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles. So we're actually playing here. Uh, the chord is A, but I'm actually holding a D shape because the capo is on the seventh fret. But what I want you to hear, guys, at home is uh, is just how we get that kind of classic twinkly chord voicing that's really unique to this song. So, you know, so understanding and being able to use a capo as we've discussed, it makes things easier. Mm -hmm. But also, it actually makes you more versatile. Yeah. Because you can play chords that literally aren't possible without a capo. Mm -hmm. As well, I think um, capos are really useful for people like singer songwriters. Because if you've written a song and you really love the chords and the way it's, you know, sequencing along, but you just can't quite get the notes, capos just instantly yeah. allow you to, you know, plonk it on the third fret and then you've got it in a different key without, you know, going through the hassles of transposing it as well um it doesn't just apply for singers it applies for all musicians so if like we were saying before if a bass player for example and you learn a bass line in one key but he can't be bothered to you know yeah. transpose it or he might not be good enough yeah you know, or like you can't do it or whatever be... yeah but like you've then got the skill to use a cafe yeah. to transpose yeah it. so if you want to very very quickly be able to change the key of a piece of music but not have to learn new chords that's where a capo comes in handy and I think that's the key, that, that is one of the absolute key points here. It's like you can, with a capo, you can change the key of a piece of music on the fly without having to learn different chords, mm -hmm. you know, super, super useful. And the last point here that we wanted to make is that using a capo opens up brand new avenues of creativity. So, you know, if you're playing in the same key all the time, it's very easy to get stuck in familiar patterns. But from a composition point of view, if you're a songwriter or, or even you're not a songwriter, you're just trying to find a vocal melody or a lead melody then playing stuff into a different key uh, moving moving the track into a different key using a capo is a great way to break out of those kind of uh, ruts that you can get stuck in um, creatively and it allows you to um, it just unlocks new things that you would never have thought of or explored 
without playing it in a different key. Okay, in the bonus pack for today's episode, you'll find the chord box for the A added nine chord that Jack played earlier. You'll also find a guide on how to use a capo correctly. And also, you'll be very happy to know, I'm sure that we've put together a, a capo chart which will show you how to play every chord uh, on each fret there using the capo. So if your mind's a bit blown by the concept that's underpinning this, then you can just look at the chord to the capo chart um, and it's just like a simple matrix that you'll be able to use which will make this much, much easier to access. There'll also be a link there to uh, an article that I think you wrote, Jack, on the site on how to use a capo, yeah, yeah. Um, which will break this down in a more detailed fashion. So yeah, tons of stuff in the bonus pack uh, for this episode uh, for what we've discussed here. And again, you can get that at nationalguitaracademy.com slash podcast4. Okay, now it's time for the next part of today's show, which is tips and advice. You've got a question. I've got some answers. You've got a question. For you, I've got tips and advice. Tips and advice is the part of the show where we answer your questions about guitar and music culture. If you've got a question for us, please email us at podcast at nationalguitaracademy.com and we'll try our best to help you out. Okay, so we got a question this week from Dave. Now, sadly, Dave didn't include his surname, so he's going to just have to be Dave for this okay. for this question. But basically what Dave wanted to know was, um, he, he was basically after a kind of step-by-step -step guide for, for learning, learning the guitar. So what would you advise, Jack? Where should we begin? So to begin with, like the absolute fundamental thing you need to start with is your posture. You need to sort out your posture. I'd say nine times out of ten out of the students that I've taught and that Mike's taught as well, if people are ever having problems when they're, begin when they're a beginner, if you show them some good posture tips, it usually sorts out those problems. Like it's, you know, it's really, really important. Some people get a bit, I guess, bummed out about posture because it's, you know, it's yeah. not the most attractive thing about guitar playing, is it really? But um, if you can sort out your posture, you're really on to a great start and it's a great yeah. foundation for the rest of your guitar playing stuff. And when we speak about posture, you know, just to clarify that for people, uh, the, the way I kind of think about that phrase, it's literally how you address the instrument, it's how you hold the guitar, what mm. you sat on, you know, the shape of your leg, where, yeah. you, where, where your bum is, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. where your hands sit on the, across the instrument. Yeah. Really, really basic stuff, but if there's errors in your posture, You'll never be able to play the guitar that you, that you want. You know, your, your your posture needs to be. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it can't be really bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of the time, for lots of beginners, it is. You know, and that's one of the things that holds them back. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. cool. So we start off with uh, with getting our posture right. Yep. So the next thing you should do is learn chords. So, it's say like, again, like ninety percent of the guitar world is if you're being a guitarist, you need to learn chords. Like. It's one of the few instruments out there which you can actually play chords on. So loads of guitar music is built of chords, so get learning some chords, even if it's just basic open ones or stepping stone chords or free strum chords or whatever. Get learning them and get them under your fingers because that will really prove a great foundation for the rest of your guitar stuff. One of the uh, keys I would say to, to learn the guitar in little steps is get round strumming. So uh, learn how to strum, start off quite simply. and Linked to that, I would say as well, um, think about the plectrum you choose to use. Good one. When you learn to strum. Yeah. The next, and really this is absolutely key to, I think, learning guitar at all, is you choose the music that you love. You go and try to, to learn to play the songs that you like the best. So I guess what, we, what we've covered off so far, guys, is we've got a great starting point. So we're getting our posture right. We're learning chords. We've got, you know... We've learned to strum. We've got a plectrum that we're happy with. It's not like a really, really thick, horrible, you know, uh, two millimeter thick plec. You know, it's like a, like nice, a bass guitar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So we've got our posture right. We've learned some simple chords. We've learned to strum, and then the next phase really is where you should just be for a long time, which is just learning songs that you love. So once you've got chords and strumming down. You know, basically what I say to everybody is you want to spend like the next six months or so just learning songs that you love. You know, that's that's what this is all about. And through doing that, you'll learn new chords and your uh, strumming and your musicality will improve. But specifically, the next step once you've got those, you know, kind of basic chords under your belt and you can strum is bar chords. Now, that's quite a big hurdle for a lot of people. In fact, I'd say it's the biggest hurdle that a guitar learner actually faces is learning to play bar chords because it's, it's really quite tough. 
And then obviously once um, you've got barcodes, you know, down, and in fact, round about that time, actually, that's when I like people to start learning some uh, scales on lead guitar. And then, you know, the sort of final, I guess, you know, the guitar sort of journey, it never really ends, does it? But, mm-hmm. but I guess the sort of final area is understanding theory and advanced chord shapes, you know. Um, so that's, I hope that helps, Dave. I hope that gives you a kind of, you know, you want to just like a step-by-step sort of overview. Okay, so I'm going to just list those out again for you. So uh, develop good guitar posture, learn basic chords, learn how to strum, learn songs that you love and just continue doing that for, <laughs> for ages. Uh, develop, um, learn how to play bar chords, uh, learn some lead guitar and scales, and then learn theory and advanced chords. I hope that helps. Okay, in the bonus pack for today's episode, what you'll find is an article there, which is an 11-step program that you can follow to learn guitar. covers what we've discussed in this segment in much more detail, um, but also has lots of links to other articles on our site, which will help you. So if that sounds like something that you think would be useful, to have a kind of structured program that you can follow, then you can get that by downloading the bonus pack for today's show, which you can get at nationalguitaracademy.com slash podcast four. Okay, now we're going to move on to the next section of today's show, which is rhythm section. ability to make your guitar playing sound more musical. So in this um, week's part of rhythm section we're going to be talking about volume consideration when you're strumming. So loads of beginners which I've taught, um, they often tend to just strum at one level like this. So hopefully you can hear from that, it's quite one dimensional really. You need to, when you're strumming you need to be considering your volume and thinking about whether you can actually play that quieter or louder or maybe even you know somewhere in between but considering your dynamics actually really improves your playing immediately it almost makes you sound like a professional instantly doesn't it one of of the things I say to people is there's not there's literally nothing you can do that will affect the way you're perceived as a guitarist that's effect that's more global than volume it's like it's everything you know and for most beginners once they've learned a few chords and they've learned how to strum they're so happy to be able to like yeah strum and play in time Mm -hmm that they kind of just do that. And that's great. That's exactly where they should be at on their guitar journey at that time. But there is a real danger that it does all become very, very one-dimensional and Mm samey. They strum the same way, at the same volume, with the same chords, and it all gets a bit sort of meh, you know. Yeah, Um, Yeah, and I think, you know, altering the volume of what you play is a great way to sound more professional, more versatile. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it makes you sound a bit more cultured as a player. You're yeah. Like, oh, there's quiet bits here. But it helps yeah. you sell Loud bits, and it helps you sell the song or the the emotion to your audience, and it adds the light and the shade to it, doesn't it? Very much so. Very much so. Tell that story. You know, the best way to think about this, and I always say to people, is when you're playing a piece of music, think about what parts you're going to play quietly and what parts you're going to play loudly. Yeah. And if you don't specifically ask yourself that question as a guitar learner, then you almost definitely won't. Th- think of it <laughs> yeah. unless you like act, intentionally like think about yeah. it so like a great moment to to do this would be just before a chorus so you might want to just drop down to you know a lower volume and before you play the chords of the chorus or you might want to build up on the last chord of a bridge to create a sense of crescendo there's tons of ways that you can do this but just like to give you a really really clear example we were thinking about some tracks that had good dynamics and one of them is uh, Chasing Cars by Snow, Snow Patrol. Patrol. Do you want to yeah. just give us a little blast of that one, Jack? Yes. Yeah, so just the transition yeah, between the two. So this surprise. is like the main riff from that song. It's... So it's quite quiet there, it's quite dainty. Yeah. <laughs> dainty. Yeah. That's, yeah, good way to put it. So if we go into the chorus now, you can hear him building up. That's a really, really good example, I think, of how we can, <coughs> how, excuse me, how we can move from something quite fragile yeah. and delicate to a sense of, oh, something's going to happen here. Yeah. And then, bang, you know, the, the, the chorus comes in and you're off and running. And actually, yeah. you know, the chord progression there, that's just one part of it. What actually sells that? 
yeah. is the volume, is yeah. the delivery. Yeah. This I, is a really powerful technique that I think a lot of people just don't even think about, you know. Yeah. I think if you think of the dynamics, the volume control, it's like a landscape. You're a landscape gardener. If you want your landscape to be just a lawn <laughs> that's flat, <laughs> yeah. boring, and all you do is go backwards and forwards, up and down, it can be monotonous, can't it? Whereas if you think it's got its own little rocky features, it's got mountains, it's got a, a really great vista, and that's what will come across in when you play it. Fantastic. Really, really cool tips there. I hope you found that useful, guys. We're going to move straight on to the next section of today's show, which is theory tips. This is the part of the show when we share some bite-sized music theory tips. Okay, this week we're going to discuss arpeggios. Jack, talk to me about arpeggios. What are they? The best way to think of an arpeggio is basically... is the, An arpeggio is exactly the same as a chord. However, there's two core differences. Is that when you play a chord, as you play all of the notes together just as one block. When you play an arpeggio, all of the notes are separate. So, for example, here's a G chord. <laughs> so that you can hear how all the notes are together. But if we arpeggiate this now, you can hear the clear difference between them. One single note, one's a group of notes. Fantastic. Okay, Rob, what's uh, the theory that's underpinning this? What are arpeggios made of? So basically, if you take the fact that a chord is made up of a, a, a triad uh, or three notes, it's normally the first, the third, and fifth note of a key that you're playing or scale. And so... Whether it's a major or a minor chord, that's the key notes in your arpeggio. Cool. So if we think of, for example, I don't know, a C major chord. It's C so major chord. So there you've got your first note is your C, then you've got your third note of the scale, which is E, and then your fifth is G. Okay. And now often with arpeggios, we'll finish it off with the octave note when we jack yeah, above. Yeah. So could you just play a C major? Yeah. So as Rob just said, we've got the C note. Yeah. So it'd be room, third, fifth, octave. Nice. So then we were basically just playing all the notes from that chord, but individually. One of the things that I like about arpeggios is that they're incredibly versatile because once you learn the shape for a major arpeggio and a minor arpeggio, it's movable, which means that you can just apply it again and again all over the fretboard. So let's say, for example, you're playing lead guitar or secondary guitar, or let's just say you're playing guitar in general, then if you want to play something a little bit different rather than just chords, which at times can be just like a wall of notes, you know, chord, 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 sometimes a more articulate and interesting way to play that is just to play the arpeggio for that chord. So this is a really, really good way that you can play notes and know that they'll work. Because if you're playing the arpeggio or notes from an arpeggio for a chord, you know it will work over whatever chord's being played because it's made of the same stuff. It's literally got the same notes in. So arpeggios are incredibly versatile. Uh, Rob, can you explain to us about like how that works with uh, from keys? So what I was just referring to there was how an arpeggio sits over a chord, mm -hmm. but how does it sit over a key? So what's great about an arpeggio is because it's completely tied in with how a key works, it's essentially the, well, it's the essential tones of a key, to be honest, that you play often as the arpeggio. It means if you've got a sequence of music that's in a particular key, you can play an arpeggio over that. Nice. So let's look at an example. Let's say a track was in the key of C major. Yeah. Let's say the chord progression was C, A minor, F, G. So, Jack, if that were the case, could mm -hmm. we just play around in the arpeggio for C major? Yeah, or A minor, or F, or G. And, we, and we know it will always work. Yeah, because they're all from the key of C. The great thing really is that cool. you could just take the simplest of the arpeggios there, the, the C, G, and it, the um, the underlying chords or progression underneath it actually colour it in a different way, so it actually yeah. you, you feel as though you're playing something different. Yeah, I love yeah. that. I, I really like that. It's a really powerful technique, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But like the chords change the way what you're playing yeah. feels. Yeah. yeah, I know that's a nice feeling. Okay, just as an, as an example, one of the things that I really love about arpeggios is you can use them to build solos or to build... Um, just riffs around in general. So there's a song that I wrote last year. The chord progression was E major, C sharp minor, B to A. So the chords of the song that went like this. So it was a rock 
rock track, you know, upbeat kind of rock track, you know, with big, big chords in E major. But I wanted something that would sit over it, uh, that would act as a nice intro, but would also sound good, sound good over those notes. So I just wanted an easy solution. So I decided to just pick out the arpeggios of those chords. And that sounds like this. <laughs> So what that, I mean, that wasn't strictly an arpeggio because I was dropping in some fourth notes there, but it was built completely around an arpeggio pattern. So if you just want something that you know is going to work and sound great and harmonize well, then arpeggios are like the ultimate sort of fallback option. The other great thing for um, arpeggios is because arpeggios use the exact same notes as chords for every chord which exists, there's also an arpeggio. So for example, if we had C major 7, you'd have an arpeggio for that. Or C minor 7. Or dominant 7. You know, there's an arpeggio for every type of chord, so it means to become extremely versatile when, you know, you're trying to play over different keys or, you know, trying to execute lead stuff or, you know, secondary guitar parts, they're really versatile. Really, really cool. So, you know, for quite a while when I sort of heard about arpeggios, I, for some reason I always kind of thought of them as being like a, more of like a classical sort of thing, you know, arpeggio, yeah. you know, it sounded like this <laughs> big fancy thing to me. Yeah. yeah. But actually, it's just a really, really simple yeah. shape. It's and what, a riff, isn't it? Yeah, it is, exactly, yeah, it basically is a riff. And then as soon as you learn that, you can apply it again and again and again. And of course, yeah. once you've got the major and the minor ones down, you can start exploring, you know, like four note ones, and sevenths and stuff like that. Okay, I hope you found this section useful today, guys. We've covered quite a lot of ground there. Um, arpeggios are a fantastic technique to sort of get under your belt. If you want to learn more about this and download some extra material that will help you get the bonus pack for this episode. Uh, for this segment, we've got, what have we got here, Jack? We had some... Uh, chord boxes for all of the yes. most common yeah, arpeggios. Yeah, so we'll basically, um, in the bonus pack, we'll provide four um, unique arpeggio shapes for um, major arpeggios on the E string and minor arpeggios on the E string, and then the same for the A string as well. Absolutely perfect. That's really cool. And again, to get that, guys, go to nationalguitaracademy.com slash podcast4. Now it's time for the final part of today's show, One Last Thing. One Last Thing before you go. Before you go. One last thing is the part of the show where we leave you with a parting gift or recommendation. Something randomly cool or interesting about music or guitar culture. Jack, what's your one last, one last thing for this week, mate? So um, over the weekend I was doing some crazy gigs with, um, it was with the covers band that I was in, but there was state, stage invasions and <laughs> um, what else, people cried surfing and jumping up on tables, it was a bit mental really. So That's how uh, they roll in Wales, yeah. <laughs> it's like they but, commit to it don't yeah, they? Yeah, oh, <laughs> it, 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 it was a bit crazy, <laughs> but um, my one last thing would be to, you know, if you're getting a bit more experience with guitar, if you're more of an intermediate guitarist, or even if you're a beginner, go out and do some gigging, like, I think for me personally, I've probably learned more from gigging over the years that I have from personal practice, like doing gigs really improves your guitar playing in a way which you just can't get from playing in your bedroom. So it stretches your comfort zone, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. It really yeah. does. It stretches your comfort zone. Uh, it makes your improvisational skills better. Mm -hmm. Makes you more confident. You meet other people. You know, yeah. it's like really cool. That's a great one, Jack. Thanks. Yeah, my one last thing for this week was to encourage people to maybe try some other stringed instruments. So one of the instruments I often recommend to our students is uh, to try playing a guitar lele. A guitar lele is a bit like a ukulele, but it's got six strings, and that means that your guitar chord shapes that you know and love, you can still play them on a guitar lele. But it has a higher tone, it's kind of like five keys higher than a standard guitar, but it sounds something like this. So it's got that kind of twinkly, it sounds like it's the music that plays behind a Google ad or something, yeah. isn't it? You know, yeah. like an Apple ad or something or like that. Or if you're a Hawaiian surf dude. Yeah, so it's like got a really nice kind of bright tone to it. But the main thing that I love about it is they're tiny. So yeah. like you can actually, if you're traveling and you want to take an instrument with you and it's not practical to take, you know, a full-size guitar, then a guitar lele is a, is a great option because it's really, really light. 
And okay, it doesn't have the warmth or body of like a standard acoustic guitar, um, but it still sounds pretty cool, you know, and it's nice just to play around with something yeah. that's a little bit different. So yeah, my, my one last thing for this week, my recommendation would be try, uh, try exploring some other stringed instruments. Rob, what's your one last thing for this week? Uh, well, this week I, I decided to do something a little bit uh, different in that I've been looking at composing some music using a different key. So I've been looking at G minor. So that was just because You're it's so easy to fall into the kind of the, moody. The, the trap, the comfort zone of um, just the same old chords kind of thing. So basically, yeah, um, instead of just always using the first, the root note and root chord, uh, looking at all the other chords and the second chord of the progression and the third chord as well, so to just mix up it to what's, get a different sound altogether. What's the benefit to you of doing that, of exploring like a lesser known key in that way? What are what are you finding? Like, what's the payoff? The payoff is for well, first of all, it means you've got to explore the neck of the guitar a little bit more because you can get different voicings from by uh, trying different chord shapes out. But also, it means you often are introduced to slightly more exotic diminished chords for example I think yeah. there's a, a minor f- flat sev- uh, a seventh with a flat five yeah. fifth uh, note so different chord shapes different voices cool so. awesome okay so um, I guess your recommendation is what well, explore some lesser yeah, so known keys yeah, to see if it unlocks stuck in new, new areas of creativity and yeah we've talked about the use of the capo This I decided I wasn't using the capo for this exploration I just wanted to to just explore the neck and just use some different chord Big shapes in. really, and, really yeah, cool. and get some different voices yeah brilliant thanks Rob that's great okay thanks for joining us today folks please let us know your thoughts on the show by emailing us at podcast at nationalguitaracademy.com this is your podcast and we want to help you so please let us know what you think works well in the show and what could be better remember you can get daily guitar tips by following us on Facebook at facebook.com slash nationalguitaracademy and lastly if you've enjoyed the show Please leave us a review on iTunes or your podcast platform of choice. Five-star reviews will help us uh, help the show grow and they'll help other guitar learners find our work. So if you've enjoyed this podcast and you want to help us out, we'd really appreciate it if you'd leave us a review. Thanks so much for your support and we'll see you next time. For each podcast, we create a bonus pack that expands on what we've discussed in the episode. Each bonus pack includes video lessons, diagrams, chord boxes, links, downloads and practice material that builds on the things we've discussed in the podcast. There's only so much that we can explain through audio and sometimes it's just much easier to show you stuff and that's where the bonus packs come in handy. To download the bonus pack for this episode, go to nationalguitaracademy.com slash podcast4.